As much as any man in our history, Charles F. Kettering illustrates the characteristics of individualism, determination, and the ability to work with others. While Charles Kettering is most often remembered for his contributions to the automobile industry, it would be difficult to find an area of modern society that doesn't owe something to the creative genius of this man. A contemporary and friend of the Wright brothers, Kettering worked with them and others in developing improved instrumentation for airplanes. This rather strange-looking plane is a pilotless missile that he developed for use in World War I. He electrified the cash register for the National Cash Register Company, NCR. His introduction of the revolutionary two-cycle diesel engine gave new life to the railroads in the 1940s and 50s. Refrigerators and air conditioners became household items after his discovery of the refrigerant Freon. In the 1920s, cars, once sold only in black, became available in a dazzling array of colors thanks to the quick-drying lacquers developed by Charles Kettering. Ethyl gasoline, which made cars more efficient, was another Kettering development. And the list doesn't stop here. Interested in medicine, education, and science, Kettering left a contribution in all of those fields. In 1927, he established the Charles F. Kettering Foundation in Dayton, Ohio, a research organization with projects in government, science, and education. In 1937, he was awarded the Legion of Honor Award for his work in fever therapy. And in 1945, Kettering and Alfred Sloan, then president of General Motors, established the now-famous Sloan Kettering Institute for Cancer Research in New York. How can we capture the full flavor of this remarkable man? Some say he was a terrific boss, the best guy in the world to work for. Others say he was so strong-minded that he could be difficult. We know he was an enthusiastic and lively dancer, but we also know dedication to his work left him little time for dancing. Many remember his gift of speech and his remarkable sense of humor. He had a knack for taking difficult concepts and making them sound simple. I was asked one time, what's the difference between a scientist and an inventor? I said, I thought the difference could be illustrated best by a loom where you weave cloth. The threads that run lengthwise the loom called the warp, that could represent your physics, your chemistry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the threads that are put in by the shuttle will represent the work that the inventor does. Now, the reason that scientists don't like inventors is because they're right angles to them. <laughs> they're neither fish nor fowl. They have to be a little bit of this, this, and this, and this, and this. And they at least ought to be on speaking terms with all of them. And they are important because I said, if you don't think that the shuttle or the wolf is an important thing, you try to sleep in a purely scientific hammock and see what happens to you. From the time the kid starts the kindergarten up until he graduates from college, he's examined two or three or four times a year, and if he flunks from once, he's out. And that's, that's very bad. Now, the inventor fails 999 times, and if he succeeds from once, he's in. <laughs> now, we think you have to learn how to fail intelligently. What kind of circumstances produce such a man? Born on a farm in Loudonville, Ohio in 1876, Kettering enjoyed the life of many Ohio farm boys. He once said, I didn't know I was underprivileged because I had to drive the cows through the frosty grass and stand in a warm spot where a cow had lain to warm my feet. I thought it was wonderful. I walked three miles to the high school in a little village, and I thought that was wonderful too. I thought of all of it as opportunity. Charles was constantly asking questions, wanting to know why grass was green or why you could see through glass. He was a great one for learning from the practical working men in town. He liked to go to Wolf's Mill, a grist mill near his home, and talk with the workers. From those practical men in the mill, he said he learned the difference between knowing a thing and understanding it. Kettering was always open to new information. What you don't know, he always said, is more important in solving a problem than what you do know. In the summer of 1896, Kettering entered the College of Worcester in Ohio. But a problem which was to plague him all of his life flared up that summer. Always painfully nearsighted, he began to suffer from blinding headaches and was unable to continue school in the fall. Adam, his brother, went to Worcester to bring the disappointed young man back home. Gradually, his eyesight improved enough that he was able to take a teaching position in Mifflin, Ohio. 
There, he spent hours of his free time conducting experiments in the back room of Robinson's drugstore with John Robinson and a schoolteacher friend, George Grunwald. Still, college was Kettering's dream, and by 1898, he entered the Ohio State University School of Engineering in Columbus. But once again, he was forced to withdraw from school because of his eyesight. He later said, I was never able to read much, so I thought a lot. Kettering signed on with a telephone line gang for the Star Telephone Line Company in Ashland, Ohio. With fresh air and exercise and lack of close work, his eyes improved. In 1901, at the age of 25, Kettering once again entered Ohio State University. Nearing graduation in 1904, Kettering was offered a job by Edward A. Deeds in the Inventions Department of the National Cash Register Company of Dayton, Ohio, NCR. NCR was the first large-scale manufacturer of cash registers, and Kettering threw himself into finding a way to take the crank off the cash register. The first electric model, developed by Charles Kettering, was marketed in 1906. Another man closely allied with Kettering at NCR was W.A. Bill Crist. Working in an old barn behind Edward Deeds' house, Crist, Deeds, and Kettering became the core of a group of inventors that became known as the Barn Gang. Kettering believed that learning was not only cumulative, building on the past, but also cooperative, blending one person's skills to complement those of another. In 1909, Kettering and the Barn Gang succeeded in making the first self-starter for the automobile. The Barn Gang formed a company called Dayton Engineering Laboratories Company, Delco for short, and Kettering became Boss Kett, a name that stuck for the rest of his life. Cadillac installed the Barn Gang's complete ignition system on its 1912 model, and the industry boomed. The number of automobiles produced and sold increased sevenfold in five years, and sales went right on climbing. The rest of the story is history. General Motors Corporation bought Delco in 1916. Kettering was hired by General Motors in 1919 to head its research laboratories. And in 1920, he was named vice president, where he served until his retirement in 1947. In 1957, Kettering died peacefully in his sleep at the age of 82. The spirit of the man, the spirit of questioning and cooperation, lives on in countless others, and in the organizations he founded. A truly remarkable man, Charles F. Kettering. I have this old story that I, I have told a great many times, and it's only good because it's true, see, which most stories oh, usually are. But I live in Dayton. That's where my home is. I can't get a job there, so I have to work in Detroit. <laughs> and naturally, I drive back and forth an awful lot between Dayton and Detroit. And this friend of mine, who also lives in Detroit, said to me one day, he said, I understand you drive from Dayton to Detroit in four hours and a half. So I said, yes, I do. He said, I don't believe it. I said, why? Well, he said, I'm a much better driver than you are, and I can't do it in four hours and a half. Well, I said, I'm going down on Friday afternoon, but don't you ride along down? And so we drove down, and we got into Dayton in four hours and a half. He said, well, my God, no wonder you can do it in four hours and a half if you don't stay on Route 25. 